The title of the lesson this morning is Fight for Your Family. Fight for Your Family. Um, as you guys know, over the past, I don't know, two weeks or so, we have been focused on our special missions contribution. And it was with great joy that on Wednesday night, we raised enough pledges to hit our special missions goal. In the New York City region, in the New York City region. And I know that in uh, New Jersey and in Connecticut, they are bringing home their missions as we speak. And so it's very exciting to know that we are in a church that does fight for their family. Amen. Go to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, and we'll start here in verse 1. Now, there, uh, you know, I was thinking about what to preach, and I'm so fired up that we uh, were pledged to hit our goal. Are you guys fired up that we're pledged to hit our goal? You know, but uh, even though we're pledged to hit our goal, I just want to encourage us that, you know, there's a, there's a conviction behind what we're doing as a church. And we're going to celebrate, and we're going to feel the victory of what we've done as a family, but I want to hit some scriptures that will help us to understand the heart of what we're doing. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Now we know this prayer is called the Lord's Prayer. If you are raised like me or Jerome, who I just found out was also raised Catholic, then this prayer is called the Our Father. And you were taught, this was like drilled into you from infancy. And so you memorized this prayer growing up. And I can still say this prayer from memory. Sometimes if I'm uh, emotionally stopped up and don't, can't find words, my, my subconscious brain goes to this prayer. Uh, because that's what was drilled into me as a child. But we understand that Jesus, this isn't the only prayer that Jesus prayed. I mean, one of my favorite prayers is in John chapter 17. It's an entire chapter of, of Jesus just pouring his heart out in prayer. And there's so many things that Jesus prayed for. It says Jesus lived a life of prayer, constantly crying out. It says in loud cries in tears to God. I imagine Jesus, if Jesus were praying this prayer, he would be praying it with a zeal and a passion Calling on God to really come into his life and, and answer this prayer. Right. You know, it's awesome here. Uh, I love verse 2 because he praises God, says, Father, hallowed be your name. But then he says, your kingdom come. And I think always on Jesus' heart was the establishment and the advancement of God's kingdom to come down onto the earth. I liked uh, Daniel and Rebecca's welcome. They're talking about uh, ascending. ascending. We're ascending church, but only if we're an ascending church. Amen? But it's cool. The only way that we can be an ascending church is if the church first was descending into the world through the Holy Spirit so that we could have a church on earth. And that is what Jesus came to establish. You know, I believe that Jesus, he understood, obviously he's God in the flesh, but Jesus understood exactly what he was fighting for in his ministry. In his three-year ministry, he had a vision for God's kingdom that had not yet come into the world, but was going to come into the world in Acts chapter 2, and what that meant for the salvation of souls all over the world. And we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. You know, the vision that God has for his kingdom was a vision that, that he had way before Jesus even came and started his ministry. Going all the way back to the Old Testament, you can literally study out hundreds and hundreds of years of prophecies where God was laying the foundation for his kingdom to come. And it wasn't just the physical kingdom of Israel. No, it was the spiritual kingdom that was going to be for all nations, all tribes, all languages. And that was going to be the kingdom that we were going to be a part of. That was all part of God's plan. You know, I believe Jesus saw that history unfolding before him before he was even born into the world. And he knew how important it was to establish his kingdom. Let's go to point number one here. Point number one is starting with the heart. Starting with the heart. Go to Ezra chapter one. Ezra chapter one. Now, we're part of a movement. We're called the sold out discipling movement. Okay, you guys heard this before? Oh, yeah. 
the sold out discipling movement. Now, it's around missions time that you find out that that's like a, not just a catchphrase, but like you literally are sold out. You know what I'm talking about? Like you literally are sold out for the advancement of the kingdom. You know what I mean? Because we literally give all of ourselves to God's kingdom. Even financially, we pour ourselves out so that churches can be planted all over the world. And, and even though we're planting 24 churches in 2022, we know that this is just literally the tip of the iceberg for what needs to happen in our generation so that all men and all women can have an opportunity to be saved. And so we're pouring ourselves out for God's kingdom. And, uh, you know, we're called the restoration movement. You know, you guys know what that means? That means that we're not just trying to reform a version of Christianity that's departed from the Bible, but we're literally trying to restore what the church actually looked like in the Bible, the one that Jesus came into the world to establish. And so we're not trying to like take a, a moving freight train, that's false doctrine Christianity, and like get it to change trajectory. No, we're saying forget that, we're not even getting on that freight train. We need to get back to the Bible and restore biblical Christianity. That's what we're doing. And if you look at the history of God's people, right, you, you see something unfolding because God establishes his kingdom, but then his kingdom enters a time of exile. And there's actually two exiles. Number one is the Assyrian captivity, the exile of the northern kingdom. And then you have the Babylonian exile. And then that's when the rest of God's people are brought into captivity in Babylon. And what happens here with Ezra, we're in Ezra chapter 1, it's the beginning of the restoration of God's kingdom in the Old Covenant. And it's a really interesting thing to study out because you had people, a few of them, who, would, who were alive during the exile. They had seen the Old Kingdom. And then you had an entirely new generation of people who didn't even see it, who were born in Babylon, born in captivity. And they were going to be sent back to restore Israel. Let's read here, Ezra chapter 1. It starts with the heart. Ezra 1, verse 1. In the year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. Now, this is actually a confirmed historical fact They've dug up the proclamation that Cyrus made and dated it, and it's historically confirmed that Cyrus actually issued this decree and, and literally sent them back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Verse 2, this is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people among you, may his God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. And the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. It starts with the heart. You know, this is really powerful because the decree is issued, and why was the, de the decree by Cyrus issued for them to go back to Jerusalem? Well, because it says the Spirit of God moved the heart of a secular emperor. God intervened in the empire, secular, non-Christian empire, atheist empire, moved in the heart of the emperor and had them sent back. Of course, the decree is issued, and then the Israelites have to rally together, and it says they rally together through the heads of the families. And so they rally together by family. And it says everyone, this is what it says in the scriptures here, word for word, right? Everyone whose heart God had moved answered the call to go back to Jerusalem. Now, for most of them, they were born in captivity. They had to uproot their lives in Babylon. Now, I believe this is what we do when we become disciples of Jesus Christ, right? We're born in captivity, and then we are met by a disciple. We hear the call of God, and the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God, not because we deserve it, stirs our heart. And when you answer the call, you uproot your life from Babylon. 
You give up everything to become a disciple, Luke 14, 33. And then you move to rebuild, restore God's modern day movement. That's what you do. And that's what they did in the Bible. They were giving everything that they had. You know, if you keep reading it, it says they even went to their neighbors and their neighbors started giving every, everything that they had. You know, I was so encouraged by this special mission. I don't know if you guys realize what happened last week. I'm still processing what happened last week. You might still be processing what happened last week. At one point, I don't know what Luke was doing over here. My job was just to record numbers and make sure we hit the goal. And I, I have no idea what happened. I just know at some point we hit the goal. And it was amazing. And you saw hearts, hearts moved by God. You know, we have single moms in our fellowship who are going door to door, asking their neighbors, asking their neighbors, asking their neighbors to help contribute to God's movement because they understand what we are fighting for as a family. You know, I want to put something on your heart this morning. The success or failure of God's church depends upon the hearts of the disciples to be moved by the Spirit of God. We got to say that again. The success of God's church depends on the hearts of the disciples to be moved by the Spirit of God. And that is how God has always worked, all the way back to the time of Ezra. We saw disciples that are following the Spirit of God. That's you guys. We saw needs met because disciples were prompted by the Spirit to sacrifice in ways that they've never sacrificed before. Disciples of Jesus Christ. You know, I think that I'm still trying to figure out the exact gap we hit, but it's got to be over 100 grand. It's got to be. I, I just, I, it has to be, just in last week alone, it has to be over $100,000. The disciples rallied together. Bible talks were hitting their goal. Confetti was being launched in the air. There's still, con- I think some confetti is going to be a permanent fixture on this floor here. And then, and then even towards the end of it, there was a, still a $20,000 gap, and disciples were like, I'll give $1,000. i will give, I'll give this much. I'll give this. Some disciples were like, I'll give 10 bucks, you know? But whatever, whatever they had, they were just giving. They were just giving. Because we understand the prompting of the Spirit to rebuild God's kingdom. You know, I was really excited about the raffle, and I'm so grateful. I, w- I wish... I would have had that idea earlier in the year. But amen to God be the glory around April 30th. I was like, you know what? I wonder if we can pull off a raffle. And we had done a raffle before in 2018, but we had to get a license. And we found out like halfway through that raffle, I think, that we had to get a license. And, uh, and it was a very big raffle. And so I'm pretty sure uh, it was like a week before we got the license before, <laughs> before we actually like did the drawing for the raffle. And, uh, and so I knew that we had to have a license to do a raffle, but I just wanted to look it up to see if there was anything that we could do. And I looked it up and I realized that you can do a, a charitable raffle without a license as long as you don't raise net proceeds above $30,000. And so I thought, you know what? $30,000 is $30,000. If we can do a raffle for $30,000, that's awesome. Let's do this raffle. And so we, you know, kind of last minute put the raffle together and just started shooting messages out. And the disciples rallied in the professionals region. We literally hit the goal of the raffle, which was to raise $30,000. And then on Saturday night, as we were doing the drawing for the final prize on Saturday night, you know, we were praying together over live stream and everything. And I was just praying, God, please move somebody's heart to, to help us get to $35,000 because then we can offset the cost of the prizes. And right after I finished the prayer, I looked at my computer and somebody donated a little bit over two grand. And we finished at $35,000 flat. $35,000 flat. And I was just blown away at the generosity of those that allow their hearts to be moved by God. Awesome. You know, it starts with the heart. And I think as disciples, we need to build a conviction over time to 
protect our hearts, to guard our hearts. Because if it starts with the heart, and it's really a relationship with God that's driven by our heart for God, then Satan's going to do everything that he can to attack your heart. Because he doesn't want you to be a sold out disciple. And if he can stop the movement, if he can stop the exiles from leaving Babylon and going back to Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple, then he's going to do everything he can to stop it. And so we have to guard our hearts. Go to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. And I quote this passage a lot and I thought, you know, I should read this passage because I realized that this was a passage when I was a, a young disciple. It was one that I was discipled on a lot. And you can only imagine why, but I had to be discipled on this passage a lot. And because I was discipled on it so much as a young Christian, I think I started to take the passage for granted. And, and only recently have I realized that if we take this passage for granted and we don't have a deep conviction on this passage, then there is a real danger that Satan could come in here and destroy what we have in our church. Because we have the kingdom, not a physical kingdom, the kingdom of the heart. And we have to guard it. Proverbs 4, 23, it says, above all else, guard Guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. The 2011 version, I believe, it says for your life flows from it, or something like that. Above all else, guard your heart. You know, we have to guard, we have to protect our hearts from the desire to be in Babylon. We have to protect our hearts from the desire to build our own kingdom. We have to protect our hearts from the desire to be corrupted by the world, to give in to impurity and and all these different things, greed, the deceitfulness of wealth, those things that Satan wants to put in our heart to stop the advancement of the kingdom. And we have to protect it with everything that we have. You know, what Satan did to Adam and Eve right in the very beginning was to try to get into their hearts, to corrupt their hearts, right? He says to Eve, did God really say that's what you're supposed to do? And so it starts with just questioning these basic convictions of the Bible. Do I really have to do that? Do I really have to be a sold out disciple? Do I really? And Satan will use hardship, he'll use pain, he'll use discouragement, he'll use whatever he can get his hands on to stop the victory of the forceful advancement of God's kingdom. And we have to guard our hearts. You know, I I was thinking and meditating on that passage, like, man, I've got to do a better job of helping my brothers and sisters to guard their hearts. I've got to do a better job. I've got to make sure I'm guarding my heart and helping other people guard their heart because that is what the kingdom of God is all about, having a pure heart. Go to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. One of my favorite Bible, t- Bible talk passages here. It's a, it's a great Bible discussion scripture. And you know, I think Jesus had a fierce desire to protect his children from being corrupted by the world. And you can read about it here in this passage, Matthew 18, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them, And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We'll stop there. You know, Jesus had a conviction. In order for us to be in God's kingdom, we have to change our heart. We have to change our heart. You know, in Ezekiel, it talks about part of the prophecy of the new covenant was that When you get baptized into Christ, the promise of God was that he would take from you your heart of stone, hard heart, and then give you a heart transplant. And he would put in you a heart of flesh, a soft, humble, innocent, childlike, faithful, not fearful, heart. That was the promise of God. And that heart transplant happens for every baptized disciple of Jesus Christ. You know, the reason why we don't baptize kids is because they already have that heart. And that's why Jesus doesn't say, go baptize the kids. He says, hey, you adults, repent and be like these kids. 
Otherwise, you have no chance of entering the kingdom of God because it's a kingdom of the heart. You know, Jesus' defense of these children is intense. Look at verse 5. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. There's your, um, you know, meek and mild lamb of God right there. Man, that's a radical passage. I've often meditated on that passage because, you know, Charmaine and I, we have two kids now. And uh, Ethan, you know, he just turned four recently. And we have Adrian, who is turning two soon. And I thought about this because, you know, I can totally understand. And if there's any parents in here, I'm sure you can understand this passage. I'm sure you can understand this passage. Because you understand, if anything is threatening your child, you know what I mean? It's like everything comes out of you. You're just like, I'm going to, you know. Where's my millstone? You know what I mean? And I think there's, there's a righteousness... There's a righteousness to defending your child. There's a righteousness to that. Now, I'll confess there's been times when I probably took those thoughts too far in my head. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I'm being real. Like, sometimes I've literally been like, I might actually kill somebody if they try to hurt my child. I'm just being honest. Those types of thoughts have been in my heart and in my mind. But then I read the passage, and I'm like, man, I bet you Jesus has the same temptation. When, when Satan is messing with our hearts like that, he just gets, oh, the zeal comes out. Where's my millstone? <laughs> like, he just goes crazy. And I realized, wow, we have got to take it to the next level in our guarding of each other's hearts. Are we willing to fiercely defend the purity of our hearts on every level, the purity of our hearts, because Jesus, Jesus is going to defend it. Jesus is going to defend it. And we don't want to be working with the enemy here who's trying to corrupt our hearts. We want to be defending the integrity of each other's hearts. You know, I was thinking about some things that Satan tries to use to corrupt our hearts, bitterness, resentment. You know, in Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about, you can just write it down. It says, let no one miss the grace of God. There's a responsibility on us to make sure no one misses the grace of God. Because a bitter root, it says, a bitter root can grow up in our hearts and defile many. Bitterness defiles the kingdom of the heart. Resentment. We have to attack these things. You know, to my shame in the past, I'm just going to be real with you guys. I've been in that place in the church. I have literally been in that place. I remember when I first moved to New York City, it was a tough transition for me. I had given up my career to go into the ministry, and I was asked to come out of the ministry and move to New York, the only place more expensive than where I was just living. (laughs) And it was tough. And I remember that that special missions year. I struggled. I struggled in my heart. And I started to get a bitter root. I started to get a bitter root. And I remember it was the first time I ever really had to deal with that in the church. And so I was talking to the people that I I needed to talk to, to get my heart right. And it finally dawned on me in that moment, because bitterness is deceitful. Bitterness tries to convince you that what you're feeling is everyone else's fault. And that's where I was. I was like, it's this guy's fault, and it's that guy's fault. It was going to defile. And it finally hit me like a sledgehammer. Bitterness is my fault. Bitterness is my sin. No one else can repent for my bitterness. It's actually impossible. It doesn't matter. They could, they could say whatever. They could say, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. They still cannot repent for my bitterness. Bitterness is a sin that will separate me from God. Because it's a kingdom of the heart. And I remember that was a big year for my maturity, spiritually. Because I just had to give it up. I was like, you know what, God, this is, this is all you. This is your plan. I'm just going to give my very best. And stop thinking about everybody else. Just give my very best to you. And that's it. And let you deal with the rest. 
Another passage you can write down is Psalm 73. And Psalm 73, 73 is kind of like the fall away psalm. It's kind of what it is, you know? And the reason why the psalmist in Psalm 73 is struggling in his heart is because he's looking at Babylon. He's looking at the world. He's looking at the unrighteous, the ones who are not emptying their bank accounts for special missions. And he's saying, man, look at the car that they drive and, and look at the house that they live in and, and look at the watch and, and look at their clothes. Look, they look like they're living the life to the full and I'm not. That's what Psalm 73 is dealing with. And that is this, the heart sin of envy. It's envy. That person has what I don't have and it turns into a despair that separates people from God. Psalm 73. And you know, the psalmist in that chapter says something really intense. He says to God in prayer, God, in vain I have kept my heart pure. Wow. I'm like, wow, that's such an intense thing to say. <laughs> that is not vanity at all. I mean, I mean, that's what you have to do to have a relationship with God. But because his heart had drifted and was going back to Babylon, the psalmist was struggling with this sin of envy. You know, sometimes we have to take these feelings to God and just be real. Yeah. And we have to remember, and what got the psalmist out of those feelings was that the psalmist went to God and it says he remembered that he was in the sanctuary of the Lord. Yeah. And he was able to restore a righteous heart before God. Wow. In Titus chapter 1, verse 15, it says, to the pure, all things are pure. Yeah. To the pure, all things are pure. Yeah. You know, sometimes when we're struggling with criticalness, we have to just examine our hearts and say, okay, is my heart pure. I'm trying to equip you guys to guard your heart. I want to equip you guys to guard your heart. And when you have those thoughts and feelings, which we all have them, we have to say, is my heart pure? Because the Bible says to the pure, all things are pure. We have to do that work on our heart. You know, I want to challenge you guys to fight for a pure heart. We had an incredible victory and I don't want Satan to get in anyone's heart. And I want to challenge you, fight for a pure heart so that we can fight for our families and continue to evangelize the world. An easy way, confess your sins, but I'm just going to put a little practical here. Okay. Proverbs 28, 13 says, confess and renounce your sins. Right. Don't vent your sins. Right. Confess and renounce your sins. That's how you deal with the heart and get it pure again. Amen. Point number two, rebuilding the walls. Go to Nehemiah 4. Right. Nehemiah 4. Preach. Now Ezra, he was sent and they started to rebuild the temple. And then Nehemiah was sent and they started to rebuild the walls. And so they had to start with the foundation, build the temple, and then repair the walls that were guarding the kingdom. Nehemiah 4 verse 10. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told, told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. Point number two is rebuilding the walls. You know, number one, they, they realized that the state of disrepair of the walls is, is something they had to start to deal with, right? Because their enemies were plotting against them. 
And so it's the same thing for us, right? We have to understand that this is a spiritual battle. And so we have to make sure that the walls are in good repair. Now, it says before they could even start to repair the walls, they had to clear out the rubble. <laughs> you guys with me here? Yeah. And so that's kind of what I'm talking about. We have to clear the rubble out of our hearts. Yeah. If there's anything there that Satan's going to use to keep us from being fully invested in God's kingdom, you got to clear out the rubble so that you can start to get at your post at the wall and start to rebuild the wall with the other disciples. And we have to understand that the second thing was that the kingdom of God requires every man, every woman, and maybe even every child to be at that wall. Because wherever the wall is exposed, God puts us there to defend it, us and our whole family. And he says, I need you to repair this wall and defend it at the same time. You know, we have to understand that we are fighting for our families. We are fighting for our families. You know, I, I'm so grateful to be in the kingdom. Like, it's just crazy. I'm just so grateful to be in the kingdom. Like, when I saw the sacrifices of you guys, I was just blown away. People were selling cars. Multiple disciples were selling cars. People were just emptying their accounts. People were going into their savings. I... Andy almost sold his guitar. I don't know if he did it. Do you know how much Andy loves guitars? People were doing crazy stuff. When they saw that other Bible Talks hadn't hit their missions, even though their Bible Talk already hit it, they heard the sound of the trumpet, they left their post that was already rebuilt, and they went and helped that other Bible Talk to rebuild their post. Everybody was fighting for their families. It says in the scripture there, remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. There's a great quote, one of my favorite quotes. A man fighting for his family is worth more than a hundred soldiers. A man fighting for his family is worth more than a hundred soldiers. You know, when I was, uh, I was the youngest growing up, and my brother, when I was at home, my brother was the enemy. When I was at home, my brother was the enemy. He threw me down a flight of stairs one time. True story. True story. Uh, I, I mean, I, like, there was some stuff. I mean, one time he, like, hit me in the head with a controller, and I wanted to make him feel bad, so I ran to the kitchen, and I put ketchup in my hair. And I was like, ah. Oh. And he was like, oh my gosh, you know, this is my relationship with my brother. But even though at home he was the enemy, you know what, when I was at school, nobody messed with me. Not because of me, but because they knew if they messed with me, some crazy kid was around here somewhere that was my older brother, and that was going to get sorted out real quick. And I remember, I have, I have in a weird way, fond memories of those times. And I think it's just because I appreciated that he was fighting for me. He was fighting for me. You know, in the kingdom of God, it's, it's amazing what the Bible teaches about the kingdom. In the story of the rich young ruler, you know, when they hear Jesus preaching to the rich young ruler and telling him to sell everything, Peter says, oh, Jesus, we've left everything we have to follow you. And Jesus affirms him. He's in verse 30, Mark chapter 10, he said, or Mark chapter 12, he says, Peter, whatever you have left, home, wives, brothers, sisters, mothers, you will gain back a hundred times more in the kingdom of God. And then he repeats it. Homes, brothers, mothers, sisters, you get your family in the church. You get your family in the church. You know, I love my family physically. I love my family physically, but I am so grateful to be in the church because if I can get my family in the church, then I can get my family to heaven. And what we have in the church is spiritual family that supersedes even our physical family. The leader, the leader of our movement, uh, Kit McKean, he baptized his mom 
yesterday. After 50 years of prayer for his mom. She's 93 years old. After 50 years of prayer for his mom and after talking to her every day, reaching out to her every day and checking in on her, he now, you know Kip has never compromised his convictions about the kingdom. But he also didn't stop loving his mom. And it was because of his convictions that a 50-year prayer was answered and his mom just got baptized. Amazing. Amazing. You see, Jesus' goal is to break down the walls that we erect in between one another. That is his goal, right? Because we have all these walls that we put up. And, and back then it was Jew versus Gentile. And Jesus had to literally go to the cross to demolish that boundary. And now it's, you know, it's all, well, you know, the church, it's just a church. It's just a church. It is not just a church. This is your, this is your home. This is your brothers. This is your sisters. This is your fathers. This is your mothers. And God wants us to fight for our family. <laughs> Clearing out the rubble. It's a spiritual war. It's a spiritual war. They were on the walls and they knew they were in a battle. Now, they literally did not have the luxury of not going to that wall. They didn't have the luxury because they knew if they didn't have their families posted at the wall that their enemies were gonna get in and destroy the kingdom. And so they had to bring everybody to the wall. Everybody had to be fighting. You know, I think about what's going on in Ukraine and the disciples in Ukraine. I can't imagine being there. I can't imagine. I look at the videos and the pictures sometimes and it literally is just apartment buildings that are crumbling because they're getting bombed. And every day it's a different apartment building. And I'm thinking to myself, what if that was my apartment building? What would I do? You know, when you're in a war, you do not have the luxury of staying at home. There is no neutrality in times of war. You have to pick up your Bible and pick, it, and pick up your spiritual weapons here and get to the front lines of the battle. And we're posted by family. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 7. Let's start in verse 9. You know, it's a great passage here, and uh, one of my favorite illustrations of this passage actually comes from the movie The Rise of the Planet of the Apes. It's kind of a pretty good movie. And uh, I really think there's a cool illustration there of this passage here, starting in Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9. It says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. In uh, The Rise of the Planet of the Apes, it's right when the apes start to like, gain human intelligence, human level intelligence. And, uh, and there's, a, there's a, you know, a scene where they're talking, two of the apes are talking to each other, and one of the apes grabs a stick and he snaps it. Yeah. And then he grabs a bundle of sticks and he tries to snap it, but he can't. Yeah. And he says to the other ape, he says, ape alone, weak. Ape together, strong. Yeah. You can learn a thing or two from some apes. You know, it's true, spiritually, spiritually. When you are isolated as a disciple, when you have barriers in your relationships with your brothers and sisters, this is a dream come true for the enemy. Because disciple alone, weak. Disciple together, strong. Strong. And, and we're not talking about just, we're not even just talking about two disciples together. Three. Keep the math going. Four, five, six. No, so let's get to 230. Let's go. No, I'm just kidding. Imagine 230 unified, sold out disciples of the New York City International Christian Church. <laughs> Satan doesn't have a chance against that. Doesn't have a chance against that. And so what's he going to do? Erect barriers between each other and God so that we can't have a victory in God's kingdom. He's going to destroy it. We have to do the work. Remove the rubble. 
get posted by family. You know, the reason why we're in Bible Talks is actually for this reason. We have Bible Talks because it's impossible for one person to have an intimate, close relationship with 230 other people. But when you have a small group of people who are unified in their purpose and they're posted at the same section of the wall, well, now you can have close relationships and you can fight together for your family. And so that's why we have our Bible Talks like that. Run to the wall and give your whole heart to the family. Last point here is leaving a legacy for our children. Leaving a legacy for our children. Now, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit Haggai chapter 1. Because what happened was, first they came back to rebuild the temple. They had to lay the foundation first. And after they laid the foundation and they had been sacrificing, remember all the sacrifices they had to make just to get from Babylon to Jerusalem. And we have to appreciate the sacrifices that our missionaries make. Just putting it in perspective. They literally quit jobs, uproot their lives. Oftentimes they have kids, like the Jews, they have kids, they're uprooting their lives, they're leaving their home, and they're going to a totally new place where they have to get a new home, a new job, etc. This is what our missionaries do, right? People are gonna be uprooting their lives to go from New York City, the greatest city in the world, to a city in the Middle East. And it's gonna be a totally different situation. And they're uprooting their lives to go there. Well, they had done that when they left Babylon. They went to Jerusalem. They uprooted their lives. They gave up so much financially just to lay the foundation. But then it tells us in Haggai 1 that after the foundation was laid, many of them started to go back to build their own personal homes. And so they stopped giving to the work of the Lord, and they were focusing on building their own houses. So what does God do? God sends them Haggai and Zechariah, And Haggai and Zechariah come in and start to preach and remind them of why they're back in Jerusalem. Not just to lay a foundation for the temple, but to finish the construction of the temple. And so they remind them. And that's what happens in Haggai chapter 1. Now, I want to put on your heart here that this legacy that we're leaving is not just for us, but it's also for our children. It's also for our children. And so don't get focused on what the world has to offer our children. Be focused on what God has to offer our children, right? Because we understand that it's important to leave something for our kids. I get that. It's righteous. But we need to leave a legacy that is spiritual, that is not just going to set them up for a good worldly life, but it's going to set them up for a spiritual life, a life in God's kingdom where they can be saved, where they can be protected by God's family. That's the legacy that we're leaving. And if we get too focused on that worldly aspect, we're going to forget the mission that we have for our family. Go to Acts chapter 2. This is our last passage here. We're coming in for a landing. And there is going to be a great baptism right after this lesson. Acts 2, verse 38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded them with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. You know, in Acts chapter 2, the promise that was given to them in in the first century was the same promise that was given to their kids which is the same promise that was given to the next generation and the next generation all the way down to our generation. Amen. Praise God. And so this promise is for everyone. It's a spiritual legacy that everybody in the world can have an opportunity to have their sins forgiven in Christ, even though they don't deserve it, and be baptized so that they can be saved and go to heaven. That promise is for everybody, including our children. And we have to leave them a spiritual legacy. You guys already heard, I'm sure, because it was announced that I emptied our bank account during midweek, last week, and I was prompted in my heart to do that because I felt like I could do more, and and missions for me personally wasn't hard this year, and I wanted to do more. And so with very little calculation, I emptied our bank account. With very little thinking into the future or planning. I emptied our bank account. I didn't think about how we were going to pay the electric bill. 
I hadn't actually paid rent yet. I emptied our bank account. And I felt fired up to do it. And I went home and I told my wife. And you know what? She supported me with all of her heart. You know, but because, but because I didn't think about it at all, she reminded me that it was Ethan's uh, fourth birthday in two days. And we had a plan. You know, he wanted to have a birthday where it was going to be, you know, cars and stuff like that, cars themed birthday. And uh, because I had spent all of our money, there was no way for us to really do that. There was no way for us to do that. And, and I realized that that was, that was a little tough. That was a little hard, not because we lost money, but because Ethan couldn't have the birthday that he necess necessarily had envisioned. And that was a little tough, you know? And I started thinking about it. I was like, you know, I didn't even think about that, but that's true. And then, Je and then she, Jesus, Charmaine. <laughs> that's how much I love you, I guess. Uh, and then Charmaine said something really uh, that, that hit me. She said... Ethan's birthday is going to be around special missions every year. And I was like, wow, that's true too. <laughs> that's true too. And I meditated on it. I really thought about it. You know, I was like, you know, that is actually a huge blessing from God. Wow. That is a huge blessing from God. Because what I want Ethan to learn from his mom and dad is not that he always gets what he wants, but that we're totally invested in the kingdom of the heart, the kingdom of God. And if that means that his birthday, by the, by the providence of God, is going to be an annual reminder that we give everything to God's kingdom, then I'm grateful that Ethan gets that reminder. Because he's going to grow up knowing what's more important than anything else in this world. I got a phone call from Tyrone and Lori yesterday. Tyrone and Lori were a couple that we baptized in New Hampshire that's part of the Manchester mission team. I've shared about them before. They were the couple that would have died on an airplane, but instead went to Bible talk. And Tyrone and Lori, they called us yesterday and they said, we just wanted to call you to express our gratitude because we just emptied our bank accounts for missions. <laughs> and I was, I was like, okay, amen. And they told a really funny story. I guess, I guess Mike Patterson is sharing a lot of the stuff that you guys are doing in Boston right now to inspire the church. And one of the things that he shared was that disciples were emptying their bank accounts. And uh, Tyrone and Lori said, well, you know what? If Aaron and Charmaine did it, we're going to do it too. And they're sharing this story with me because apparently they had made that decision separately and they have separate bank accounts. And so Lori emptied her bank account and then she went home and talked to Tyrone. <laughs> and, and Tyrone was like, I emptied the other bank account. And then and that, and they called us and they were like, yeah, we literally don't have any money. <laughs> but you know what was really cool is that this is what they said next. They said, we're so grateful that you guys are our spiritual parents. And I was like, man, that, is, that was really encouraging. Spiritual legacy. The legacy that we're leaving our children. You know, to close it out here, I do want everybody to be very fired up. Be very fired up about what we did. But be reminded about why we did it. Why we did it. We did it because we're fighting for our brothers, our sisters, our wives, our children. We're fighting for our family. Guard your heart above all else. Give your whole heart to defending the family. And let's leave a spiritual legacy that's going to evangelize the world in this generation. To God be the glory.